Monsieur le conseiller fédéral, Monsieur le président du Conseil d'État, Monsieur le président du Grand Conseil, Mesdames et Messieurs les députés au Grand Conseil, Monsieur le conseiller administratif, Mesdames et Messieurs, chers collègues, c'est pour moi un très grand plaisir de pouvoir vous accueillir dans cette salle pour un événement important pour notre cité, pour notre université, un événement sur une thématique qui peut-être peut paraître un peu difficile d'accès pour un grand nombre d'entre nous, et pour moi en particulier aussi, mais un événement extrêmement important qu'on a intitulé « Promesses quantiques du XXIe siècle ». Et ce titre, je crois, est particulièrement bien choisi pour l'événement de ce soir, parce que je pense qu'il reflète parfaitement ce que la physique quantique représente pour la science de demain, mais plus encore pour notre pays, et pour aider nos sociétés à affronter les nombreux défis qui les attendent. Car même si ce terme reste quelque peu mystérieux pour beaucoup d'entre nous, je l'ai évoqué tout à l'heure, il recèle bien des espoirs et bien des perspectives qui, pour beaucoup d'entre elles, sont déjà en train de se concrétiser. Ces espérances vont, comme je l'ai dit, bien au-delà du progrès technologique. Elles répondent à des défis sociétaux, tels que la crise climatique, grâce à des matériaux plus résistants, à des matériaux plus légers, à des matériaux supraconducteurs, ou à des défis liés à la sécurité informatique grâce à la communication quantique. Plus que dans d'autres champs scientifiques peut-être, la physique quantique remplit parfaitement une de nos missions, celle des liens avec la cité, notamment dans le domaine des innovations. Dans tous les domaines de la physique quantique que l'on peut regrouper en trois champs principaux, comme vous le savez, à savoir d'une part les ordinateurs quantiques, d'autre part les matériaux quantiques et finalement la communication quantique, des sommes assez astronomiques sont actuellement investies par des agences nationales de recherche et par des entreprises privées. Et la concurrence en ce domaine est extrêmement vive. Elle est particulièrement féroce pour s'attacher les talents dont nous avons besoin pour maintenir et renforcer encore la position de notre pays et de notre université face à la concurrence d'entreprises privées, d'une part, mais aussi de centres de recherche qui offrent souvent des conditions avec lesquelles nous avons parfois des difficultés à rivaliser. Et nous nous sommes rendus compte, lorsque nous avons essayé de trouver un successeur à notre professeur Nicolas Jusin qui partait à la retraite, heureusement aujourd'hui, nous y sommes parvenus. C'est la raison pour laquelle je suis particulièrement heureux, nous sommes particulièrement heureux du partenariat que nous avons pu établir avec le SIT, qui nous a permis d'attirer à Genève le professeur Titel, que vous aurez le plaisir d'entendre dans quelques instants. Si la concurrence est très vive dans le champ de la physique quantique, la bonne nouvelle est que notre université et notre pays possèdent des atouts majeurs dans le domaine de la recherche. Et il convient de les préserver et de les entretenir qu'à tout retard pris en ce domaine ne pourrait être facilement comblé. C'est la raison pour laquelle je me réjouis de l'initiative nationale lancée sous l'égide du CEFRI avec le soutien de notre conseiller fédéral. Je me réjouis tout autant des accords qui ont pu être signés grâce à M. Parmelin, présent avec nous ce soir, qui n'a pas économisé ses efforts pour conclure des accords bilatéraux avec les États-Unis et le Royaume-Uni. Certes, ces accords ne remplaceront pas notre participation à Horizon Europe et à son flagship dans le domaine quantique, lequel restera sans doute malheureusement fermé, même si notre association à Horizon Europe se con confirme. C'est à la raison aussi pour laquelle nous avons œuvré en étroite collaboration avec l'EPFL, l'ETHZ et le PSI notamment, à mettre sur pied une collaboration au niveau suisse pour faire face à la concurrence internationale. Et je salue en particulier les représentants de ces institutions qui ont tenu à être ce soir avec nous pour cet événement important. C'est aussi ce qui nous a conduit à créer ici à l'Université de Genève, au sein de la Faculté des sciences, un centre quantique, le Geneva Quantum Center, qui fait d'ailleurs toutes les forces importantes présentes au sein de notre institution et qui recouvre les trois domaines de la physique quantique que j'ai mentionné tout à l'heure. La création de ce centre était une évidence, basée sur l'excellence de nos chercheuses et chercheurs présents à Genève, mais c'était aussi une évidence fondée sur un écosystème assez exceptionnel à Genève un écosystème d'acteurs étroitement intriqués, comme il se doit dans le champ de la physique quantique. Cet écosystème est formé par de nombreuses entreprises, dont ID Quantique, que je salue ce soir comme leader mondial dans le champ de l'information quantique, et nous aurons l'occasion d'entendre tout à l'heure Grégoire Ribordi, qui nous parlera un peu des promesses que ce domaine ouvre par rapport aux applications industrielles en particulier. 
Et vous avez aussi euh, à Genève la présence du CERN. Je représente aussi, euh, salut ici, le représentant du CERN qui a tenu à être avec nous ce soir. Merci beaucoup parce que je crois que c'est aussi un, un élément extrêmement important de ce réseau d'acteurs qui, dans le domaine quantique, vont agir ici pour euh, permettre à, à Genève, à notre pays, de se développer à la hauteur de ses promesses. Et finalement, en réseau de haute école, les PFL très, très proches de l'Université de Genève, le, les PFL, les PFZ, euh, les HES aussi, parce qu'il faut euh, mettre en évidence le fait que dans le domaine de la physique quantique, c'est toute la chaîne de formation qui est nécessaire pour pouvoir former les personnes qui, demain, vont permettre à la Suisse de se maintenir au niveau où elle est à l'heure actuelle. On a besoin de très bons ingénieurs, on a des besoins de personnes qui sont formées dans les HES pour pouvoir aussi faire en sorte que la recherche appliquée puisse utiliser les instruments dont nous avons besoin pour ces expérimentations qui sont utilisées par nos chercheuses et chercheurs. Vous l'avez compris, c'est pour nous un événement extrêmement important. Je remercie en particulier le conseiller fédéral, M. Parmelin, et le conseiller d'État, M. Poggia, d'avoir euh, insisté pour être avec nous ce soir. Je crois que c'était important et c'est une forme de reconnaissance extrêmement euh, marquée que nous apprécions à sa plus haute euh, valeur. Je vous remercie beaucoup de votre attention et j'ai le plaisir maintenant de passer la par parole à M. Meyer, qui est provost du et cité. Merci beaucoup de votre attention. Excellente soirée à vous toutes et tous. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Flukiger. Je représente ici le SIT, Schaffhausen Institute of Technology, tout autant que Constructor University. Donc, s'il y a un certain flou entre ces deux noms, ne vous inquiétez pas, vous n'êtes pas les, les seuls. En fait, nous sommes au moment clé où nous passons d'une appellation à l'autre, ceci pour expliquer le, le contexte de notre, notre sigle et de notre, de notre université. L'université, le, le Schaffhausen Institute of Technology, a été créé il y a environ trois ans par Serge Bell, basé à Schaffhausen, dans, dans le nord de la Suisse, et euh, s'est étendu dans différentes directions, euh, techniques et géographiques, et en particulier a établi une association étroite l'année dernière, ou cette année en réalité, avec une université allemande, Jacobs University, Jacobs University Bremen, et a des, toute une série d'initiatives dans différentes directions. Donc il était nécessaire en quelque sorte d'utiliser un terme unique et unificateur pour toutes ces différentes euh, initiatives, et le, le terme qui a été choisi, et que je pense nous utilisons ici en public, pour la première fois ce soir, et Constructor University, qui représente bien le concept, qui représente bien le, le concept que, euh, que, que JUB euh, dé, définit. Euh, ce que vous avez d'ailleurs sur la L'arrière-plan de, de Transparent ici, c'est la photo du, du campus de Brême, qui est un grand campus. Le campus, campus de Chafouz est beaucoup plus petit. Donc il s'agit d'une université d'un nouveau type qui est un type hybride de différentes façons. C'est-à-dire qu'il est hybride euh, en, en, termes de, en termes géographiques, puisque vous, a, vous avez actuellement les, les campus de Chafouz et les, le campus de Brême. Et bien entendu, à partir d'aujourd'hui, le centre de, de Genève qui nous nous en sommes sûrs, va jouer un rôle fondamental, mais c'est aussi hybride et multiforme par son concept avec un ensemble d'activités diverses, enseignement, recherche, mais aussi entrepreneuriat, et nous avons toute une série de sociétés, de, de compagnies qui font partie de l'orbite Constructor, SIT Learning dans le domaine de l'enseignement professionnel de haut niveau, SIT Rollos et SIT Alemira dans le domaine de la, le, du support technique pour l'éducation, pour avec des techniques avancées d'intelligence artificielle en particulier, et SIT Services pour soutenir l'ensemble. Et finalement, nous sommes hybrides par la superposition, si j'ose utiliser ce terme, d'un certain nombre de disciplines, l'informatique, la physique, les, les sciences de la vie, les sciences du management et, et des affaires, et les, les, les sciences sociales. Nous, nous, nous pratiquons à fond la multidisciplinarité. La multidisciplinarité, 
en sus d'être difficile à prononcer et difficile à pratiquer, on, on, on fait beaucoup de discours sur la multidisciplinarité, c'est très, très à la mode, mais quand on essaye dans un contexte concret universitaire de faire de la multidisciplinarité, et là je peux faire référence à ma propre expérience à, à l'EPFZ, c'est très difficile pour différentes raisons. Et, nous, et le, la, les sciences euh, du, du quantique sont un cas euh, d'école de la nécessité et de l'utilité de la multidisciplinarité, c'est-à-dire qu'on a besoin de physiciens, bien sûr, mais aussi d'informaticiens et de mathématiciens. Donc nous espérons profondément que le centre quantique ici va permettre cette fertilisation croisée entre toute une série de disciplines qui est vraiment au cœur de notre vision des choses. Euh, quelques mots supplémentaires sur euh, euh, SIT plus JUB equals euh, euh, constructor. Euh, nous avons cette portée internationale que, dont j'ai déjà parlé, avec en particulier un, un conseil scientifique, un strategic advisory board, dont je ne euh, décrirai pas les membres individuels, si ce n'est pour euh, remercier ceux qui sont ici, en particulier euh, Konstantin Novasiolov, euh, prix Nobel de physique, qui est, qui est, qui est l'une des personnalité prestigieuse qui constitue ce conseil scientifique qui nous guide et qui nous sert en quelque sorte à définir la politique scientifique et la politique de, de, de recherche de façon que nous soyons en lien avec nos partenaires, en particulier à partir d'aujourd'hui à l'Université de Genève, que nous soyons à même de déceler les sujets les plus importants et les plus prometteurs pour l'avenir. Donc c'est un très grand honneur pour moi d'être ici, euh, en particulier de, dans, ce, de, dans cette ville de Genève et ce, ce, ce milieu universitaire de Genève qui a été si euh, productif, et si euh, avancé, si innovateur dans le domaine des euh, sciences quantiques et des applications des sciences quantiques, avec en particulier bien sûr le professeur Nicolas Gisin. Euh, nous attendons énormément de cette euh, une nouvelle entreprise et nous sommes particulièrement heureux que le CERN y soit euh, ajouté et il soit maintenant associé et ce qui me permet de présenter l'orateur suivant qui est monsieur Alberto Di Melio, euh, responsable de l'innovation pour les technologies de l'information au CERN. Merci et tous mes voeux au centre pour un très grand succès dans les années à venir. Merci beaucoup, Doyen Mayer, merci, recteur Fulkiger, président Podja, euh, councillor Parmelin. Euh, C'est un grand plaisir pour moi d'être ici aujourd'hui pour euh, vous amener les salutations du CERN et de la directrice générale du CERN, Fabiola Gianotti, à l'occasion de cet événement. Euh, vous savez, depuis 1954, le CERN est à la pointe de la recherche scientifique fondamentale dans la physique euh, des, des, des hautes énergies. Et L'effort collectif des, des milliers de scientifiques et d'ingénieurs dans le monde entier a montré dans, dans, dans toutes ces années qu'avoir des, des objectifs ambitieux, une vision et une communauté motivée peut générer en effet des de résultats remarquables. Euh, non seulement dans, dans les sciences fondamentales, mais aussi dans la technologie, dans les façons de travailler et euh, dans l'impact que ces recherches peuvent avoir sur, sur la société. Euh, ces efforts incessants pour faire progresser la, la science ont bien entendu une valeur en soi. Euh, en effet, la récompense finale de ces recherches euh, est euh, la, la définition de, de, peut-être des de, de réponses à, à questions comme l'origine de l'univers ou le, les mécanismes qui, qui règlent de euh, manière très sophistiquée la matière et notre réalité. Cependant, parfois, le... le, le le voyage vers, cette, vers, vers une destination est aussi important ou parfois même plus important que la destination elle-même. Et les progrès technologiques sont nécessaires pour faire avancer la science et euh, inversement, la science doit soutenir la, la technologie et créer des opportunités pour de nouvelles percées technologiques avec encore un impact très important sur la société et, et nos vies. Euh, par exemple, de la part du CERN, vous savez, le World Wide Web, on, a, on vient de fêter récemment le 30e anniversaire de, 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 
de la définition du, du, du web, a été créé au tout début comme un moyen de partager les informations entre scientifiques. Et la grille de calcul de, de l'accélérateur, de LHC, a contribué, il y a plus de 20 ans, à introduire les concepts qui aujourd'hui forment les infrastructures cloud modernes. Et encore, la recherche dans les accélérateurs de particules pour la, pour la physique, pour la science, aujourd'hui permet d'avoir des accélérateurs médicaux qui sont utilisés partout dans le monde pour, pour traiter les, 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 les cancers. Alors, l'impact que ces technologies et, ces, et, et, et la recherche scientifique ont est très visible euh, dans la vie de, de chacun de nous. Et l'attention à la technologie et à la science est donc très au cœur de la mission du CERN. Euh, les technologies quantiques, bien sûr, font partie de cette, de, de, de cette attention. Et il y a un énorme enthousiasme euh, dans ces dernières années dans les technologies euh, quantiques. Le, le, le prix Nobel cette année, vous, vous, vous savez, a été décerné à trois scientifiques qui ont contribué avec des expériences pionnières à, à, à étudier le phénomène quantique qui, qui soutient la communication euh, quantique. Euh, la chose très intéressante, bien sûr, c'est que la, la recherche dans les dernières années a commencé à passer vraiment de la théorie aux applications pratiques. Et moi-même, et je pense tout le monde, a, a observé une accélération euh, sans précédent peut-être dans, 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 dans le développement et l'application de ces, ces technologies, avec la possibilité peut-être dans, dans, dans un avenir pas très loin euh, de, de résoudre des problèmes qui aujourd'hui ne sont pas pratiquement, euh, euh, on ne peut pas résoudre avec les, des technologies classiques, même avec des, des, les, les, les puissants ordinateurs à, à haute performance d'aujourd'hui. Euh, à ce but, euh, dans 2018, le CERN a commencé à regarder euh, les, les, les technologies quantiques et la, et la partie de, euh, de, de informatique quantique pour comprendre quel est le, le possible impact de ces technologies sur la recherche physique et, euh, inversement, quelle est la contribution que la recherche physique pourrait avoir euh, à développer ces technologies quantiques pour, pour tout le monde. Euh, depuis, la, de, 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 depuis 2018 et en particulier de, de 2020, le CERN a créé une euh, initiative de, de recherche dans la technologie quantique que, que j'ai l'honneur de, de coordonner euh, aujourd'hui, euh, qui a euh, établi une, euh, un réseau de, de, de collaboration et de recherche avec euh, plusieurs initiatives dans les États membres du CERN et aussi à, à l'international, institut de recherche université et aussi euh, l'industrie. En, en particulier, il est très évident que l'écosystème suisse en général et à Genève en, en particulier est très riche et, et très ambitieux. Et nous avons euh, heureusement la possibilité de travailler avec ces, ces, ces très riches environnements avec des collaborations en hein, informatique quantique, communication et la construction de, de capteurs quantiques pour plusieurs applications, pas seulement la, la physique. Euh, Alas, nous, nous, nous vivons aujourd'hui, vous le savez très bien, euh, un, un moment complexe dans, dans l'histoire de, de, de l'humanité avec des, des, des défis difficiles à surmonter, sociaux, médicaux, financiers, environnementaux, et diplomatique. Et il faut donc redoubler les efforts de collaboration entre disciplines, entre communautés, entre les pays pour, euh, pour euh, confronter ces, ces périodes de, de crise. À ce but, et euh, grâce à l'énorme potentiel quantique, de, 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 le potentiel de la recherche quantique, euh, le, le CERN a aussi le, le plaisir d'être entre les, les premiers euh, euh, organisation à soutenir et à, à contribuer au travail de, de la Fondation GESDA, encore une fois ici à Genève, qui, une chose qui témoigne la richesse de l'environnement euh, à Genève, GESDA, la Genève Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator, qui a lancé en octobre cette année euh, la, la, la proposition de créer un Open Quantum Institute euh, qui a, a entre ses, ses buts d'assurer que l'accès aux technologies quantiques euh, est euh, plus répandu de, dans le monde à, à, à tout niveau, pas seulement à ceux qui ont la possibilité aujourd'hui de, de le faire, euh, pour contribuer à, à, à aider toute l'humanité. Euh, 
Et l'Open Quantum Institute s'appuiera sur l'expérience du CERN en unissant les personnes qui, qui travaillent dans ces, ces environnements pour repousser les frontières de la science et avoir un impact concret sur la, 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 sur la, la, la vie de, 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 de nous tous. Je suis donc honoré d'être ici aujourd'hui avec vous et de, je, je vous félicite, je félicite l'Université de Genève et le site Constructor pour cette euh, initiative anticipatrice et, et prometteuse et bien sûr je, 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 euh, je confirme l'intérêt du CERN à travailler avec vous dans, cette, dans, dans, dans la technologie quantique pour, pour l'avenir. Merci beaucoup, merci pour votre attention. Et je passe donc la parole au président. Je passe maintenant la, la parole à monsieur le conseiller d'État, président du Conseil d'État, monsieur Maro Poggia. Merci de votre présence. Monsieur le conseiller fédéral, monsieur le recteur de l'Université de Genève, monsieur le responsable de l'innovation du département des technologies de l'information du CERN, Monsieur le doyen du Schaffhausen Institute of Technology, Mesdames et Messieurs, en vos titres et fonctions, Mesdames et Messieurs, d'emblée, permettez-moi, Monsieur le recteur, de vous remercier tout particulièrement pour votre invitation et l'organisation de cet événement inspirant. C'est un plaisir de faire partie ici ce soir de cette lumineuse assemblée et de pouvoir vous transmettre à toutes et à tous les cordiales salutations du Conseil d'État Genevois. Lorsque cette invitation m'a été remise, je l'admets, la perspective de discourir sur la communication quantique m'a d'abord plongé dans la perplexité. Ce sont les chemins du droit et un peu de la politique qui ont jalonné ma carrière. Que pouvais-je donc trouver à dire de pertinent sur la communication quantique En termes de quantique, je dirais, en guise de boutade, c'est davantage le quantique suisse qui m'est venu à l'esprit que la quantique suisse. Puis je me suis souvenu du récent déjeuner que nous avons partagé au Conseil d'État avec le médaillé Fields, Hugo duminil copin qui a mis Genève et l'Université de Genève sous les feux de l'actualité récemment. Je l'avoue, la mathématique dure ne m'est pas particulièrement plus familière que la communication quantique et pourtant les échanges que nous avons eus m'avait captivé. Hugo duminil copin raconte qu'il lui est déjà arrivé de trouver la solution à certains de ses problèmes en promenade avec sa petite fille et son bouvier bernois. Il dénonce par ailleurs le principe de sacralité des mathématiques qui interdit les erreurs, puisque c'est parfois de l'erreur, dit-il, que naît la bonne idée. Cela me parle tout particulièrement. Hugo duminil copin tout brillant scientifique qu'il soit, n'en est donc pas moins humain avec ses pot potentielles erreurs. En tant que magistrat chargé de la santé, comme vous le savez, nous avons eu quelques défis à relever main dans la main avec les scientifiques ces dernières années. J'étais déjà convaincu de tout ceci. Mais j'avais retiré de l'échange avec Hugo duminil copin plus que jamais qu'il ne faut pas considérer la science comme un monde à part un monde qu'il faudrait laisser aux seuls scientifiques sous prétexte que l'on n'y comprend pas grand-chose. D'abord parce que la science progresse si vite et ouvre des champs d'inconnus si vastes ces dernières années qu'elle laisse même les scientifiques parfois sans réponse et sans voix. C'est sur la pierre de la science que se bâtit la prospérité de demain pour nos nations et pour nos civilisations. Parce que la science soulève des interrogations fondamentales éthique, morale. Ainsi, les sciences dites « dures » sont inextricablement liées aux sciences humaines et sociales et plus largement à la société. Lorsque des femmes et des hommes disent leurs craintes face à certains progrès scientifiques, il ne s'agit pas de les mépriser, mais de les entendre, de les comprendre. Lorsque des femmes et des hommes disent leurs craintes d'une science qui nous déshumaniserait, il ne faut pas les mépriser, mais les entendre, et les comprendre. Lorsque des femmes et des hommes disent leurs craintes face à l'inconnu, face à l'incompris, face à l'infini, il ne s'agit pas de les mépriser, mais de les entendre et de les comprendre. Ne pas les entendre, ne pas les comprendre, c'est faire le lit pardon, de la désinformation et du complotisme. En tant qu'humain, aujourd'hui, 
nous faisons face à des défis plus complexes que jamais, des défis globaux qui secouent l'humanité et la planète tout entière. Le changement climatique et les mouvements de population, les dégradations des écosystèmes, les crises sanitaires, sociales, culturelles, les enjeux de libre marché, des nouvelles technologies, de la surveillance de masse, etc. etc. Le Conseil d'État Genevois est conscient des enjeux colossaux que nous réservent les décennies à venir. Il faut se projeter dans un futur lointain en matière de transition écologique et de numérisation, de santé, de vieillissement, de logement et de mixité sociale, de mobilité. Le canton de Genève entretient une relation forte avec la science, avec la diplomatie, avec le multilatéralisme. Nous sommes honorés d'héberger le CERN et de multiples organisations internationales actives dans le secteur scientifique. Les, les défis que nous évoquions tout à l'heure sont immenses, certes, mais disons-le franchement, la science a progressé à un rythme fulgurant ces dernières décennies. Ces progrès redéfinissent notre relation vis-à-vis -vis de nous-mêmes, de la société, de l'environnement. Ces progrès sont autant d'opportunités qui doivent servir le bien-être collectif. Et pour atteindre cet objectif, le seul chemin est la coopération. La coopération entre les pays, bien entendu, mais aussi la coopération entre le secteur public et le secteur privé, et la coopération entre la science et la société. Afin de lutter contre la désinformation, la société a besoin d'un accès à plus de sciences, plus de preuves, plus de faits. Nous avons en société besoin de plus d'explications, de plus d'échanges, de plus de connexions, de plus de raisons, de plus de logique. C'est pourquoi l'Université de Genève et le Conseil d'État Genevois se font fort de renforcer les liens entre le monde académique et la cité. Car c'est bien le citoyen et l'humain qui doivent être au cœur de la réflexion tant du politique que de la science. Et cela est d'autant plus important lorsque nous traversons des temps troublés comme à présent. Car nous avons beau ne rien y comprendre, nous le voyons avec le succès que rencontre l'astronaute Thomas Pesquet, avec l'effervescence que provoque la nouvelle d'un Bernois qui rejoindra un jour l'Agence spatiale européenne, la science nourrit toujours les rêves de demain. La science offre de l'optimisme et de l'espoir. Elle est un émerveillement pour la génération actuelle et future. Elle élève nos esprits à toutes et à tous. C'est pourquoi je salue votre engagement et je vous remercie de votre attention. Maintenant de passer la parole à Monsieur le Conseiller fédéral Guy Parmelin. Merci beaucoup de votre présence, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président du Conseil d'État, Monsieur le Recteur, Mesdames et Messieurs, en vos titres, fonctions et innombrables qualités, à ceux précisément qui se demande quelle qualité il faut pour devenir conseiller fédéral, j'aurais envie de répondre la polyvalence en premier lieu. Le mois de novembre qui s'achève m'a en effet vu m'exprimer tour à tour, l'autre jour devant le congrès de l'Union syndicale suisse, auparavant devant le cercle des chefs de cuisine du canton de Berne, des entrepreneurs balois ou encore des agriculteurs lauréats d'un prix d'innovation. La vie d'orateur politique est décidément bien variée. Cet itinéraire gravite aujourd'hui sur une toute autre orbite, avec nos regards respectifs sur la technologie quantique, un thème ardu sur lequel je dois vous avouer que je n'aurais jamais imaginé délivrer un message devant un tel parterre académique. Et je vous remercie de m'avoir lancé ce défi. Depuis ces déc des décennies, nous vivons sous l'empire des technologies quantiques 1.0 comme les lasers et, ou les transistors des puces électroniques. Avec l'avènement des technologies quantiques 2.0, nous franchissons un pas supplémentaire. Il s'agit d'une révolution, si j'en crois les dires des spécialistes de la superposition et de l'intrication. Un monde de chercheurs, de développeurs et d'investisseurs a ainsi vu le jour autour de ces technologies aussi bien dans les pays industrialisés que dans les pays émergents. 
Il est vrai que le potentiel quantique est immense. Dans ce domaine, je peux affirmer que la place intellectuelle et industrielle suisse n'est pas à la remorque de la Chine, de l'Inde, de la Corée du Sud ou des États-Unis, même si ces pays investissent déjà des dizaines de milliards dans, des sciences, dans les sciences et les technologies quantiques, en particulier dans l'informatique quantique. Les enjeux sont considérables. Ils dessinent des perspectives inédites en termes de traitement et de vitesse de circulation de l'information. Nous n'entrevoyons ici rien de moins que la création de nouveaux matériaux, de nouveaux médicaments ou encore de nouvelles capacités logistiques. Il se dit que Quantum 2.0 aura sur notre civilisation un impact aussi massif que jadis l'invention de la machine à vapeur. Ainsi, après celle de l'industrialisation, le monde est sur la voie de la quantumisation. La concurrence internationale est extrêmement vive dans ce secteur. Il s'agit en effet d'être aux avant-postes de la maîtrise de cette technologie et des défis qu'elle nous lance, par exemple en matière de sécurité des données. La Suisse est fort bien positionnée à cet égard, ne serait-ce que par le nombre, par l'impact des publications que nos milieux scientifiques consacrent à ce sujet. Cette situation enviable est confirmée par des éléments tangibles. J'aimerais citer ici la signature en octobre dernier d'une déclaration de coopération entre le gouvernement américain et le SEGFRI, le secrétariat fédéral à la formation, à la recherche et à l'innovation, en matière de quantum. Un mois plus tard, nous signions avec le Royaume-Uni un Memorandum of Understanding sur la collaboration en matière de recherche où le thème quantique figure en toutes lettres. Pourquoi la Suisse se distingue-t-elle tant en la matière parce que les différents acteurs de la recherche, des hautes écoles et des institutions de recherche et innovation ont identifié très tôt le potentiel de ces technologies. Et cette précocité doit leur valoir toute notre connaissance. La Confédération n'est pas en reste, pour autant, puisqu'elle a lancé plusieurs programmes dans le domaine de Quantum sous l'égide du Fonds national suisse. Deux d'entre eux sont en cours. Ces programmes ont ouvert la voie à des clusters situés au bord du Léman, comme l'université où nous sommes aujourd'hui, ou l'école polytechnique fédérale de Lausanne, et au nord-nord-est du pays avec l'école polytechnique fédérale de Zurich, l'université de Bâle et celle de Zurich. Et toutes ces institutions, mesdames et messieurs, peuvent se targuer aujourd'hui d'une excellente renommée internationale et d'une expertise reconnue dans ces domaines de pointe. Les programmes dédiés sont assortis d'un investissement de plus de 400 millions de francs de la part de la Confédération et des hautes écoles. Et il y aurait d'autres activités à citer, puisque, par exemple, le domaine des EPF, des écoles polytechniques fédérales, financé par la Confédération, a lui aussi énormément investi dans Quantum. Mesdames et messieurs, les chiffres témoignent de cette répartition des tâches qui voit la Confédération dans le rôle de l'initiatrice et les hautes écoles dans celui de pilote. Bien sûr, la Confédération peut promouvoir et soutenir financièrement la recherche de pointe, mais ce n'est pas elle qui prend les risques de l'aventure scientifique. Aussi, j'aimerais féliciter ici les cantons qui ont le courage d'engager sur le long terme des moyens importants au service de cette même aventure. Une reconnaissance au moins équivalente est due au secteur privé qui investit massivement dans la recherche afin de favoriser le transfert de savoir et de technologie. Pour être complet, j'aimerais rappeler deux cartes maîtresses de la politique suisse d'encouragement de la recherche et de l'innovation. En premier lieu, le fait que ce soit prioritairement de la recherche que les idées émanent. Le système suisse d'encouragement de la recherche s'appuie en effet principalement sur une conception dite « bottom-up », les programmes top-down constituant l'exception. Laisser les chercheurs prendre l'initiative et donner les impulsions est notre facteur clé de succès en Suisse. En second lieu, j'aimerais évoquer InnoSuisse, notre propre agence fédérale d'encouragement de l'innovation qui forme un tandem avec l'activité déployée par le Fonds national suisse au profit de la recherche. Tous deux sont reliés par le programme Bridge, 
qui est l'interface entre la recherche fondamentale et l'innovation basée sur la science. Cependant, ce moment, c'est malheureusement un autre pont, Horizon Europe, qui fait défaut, un pont avec le septième programme cadre de recherche et d'innovation de l'Union européenne. En matière de recherche aussi, en matière de recherche surtout, la coopération internationale est essentielle. Notre monde est devenu trop complexe pour que les défis qui se posent à lui puissent être relevés par un pays tout seul. L'idée centrale de la stratégie internationale FRI du Conseil fédéral est ainsi de renforcer, par le truchement de nos échanges internationaux, la compétitivité scientifique et industrielle de la Suisse. En direction de l'Europe, c'est vrai, ces échanges se sont grippés. Il n'en demeure pas moins, et je le redis ici avec force, que l'association complète à Horizon Europe ainsi qu'au programme Digital Europe reste l'objectif déclaré du gouvernement suisse. Il en va des progrès à réaliser ensemble, notamment, mais pas seulement et pas exclusivement, en matière de technologie quantique, de cybersécurité, d'intelligence artificielle, de blockchain ou encore d'espace, en rappelant au passage que l'ESA vient de sélectionner un Suisse parmi ses futurs astronautes. Pour l'heure, le CEFRI s'emploie à mettre en œuvre des mesures d'atténuation dans des domaines ciblés afin d'amortir les effets négatifs de cette exclusion sur les participants suisses. Le Conseil fédéral a décidé cette année de financer des mesures d'atténuation pour Quantum, l'un de ces domaines cibles, et de lancer l'initiative Swiss Quantum 2022. Jusqu'en 2024, ce sont ainsi plus de 40 millions de francs qui seront à disposition à cette fin. Je me félicite de l'ancrage de Swiss Quantum dans le domaine de la recherche, ce que garantit le fait que l'Académie suisse des sciences naturelles ait été mandatée par le CEFRI pour nommer la commission ad hoc et mettre en place l'organisation structurelle de ce dispositif. Du côté de la Confédération, nous sommes très heureux que le professeur Nicolas Gisin, chercheur renommé en sciences quantiques, ait été désigné en qualité de président de la dite commission. Fondateur d'idées quantiques, M. Gisin est au bénéfice d'une vaste expérience et d'une grande expertise dans la collaboration avec l'industrie. Il incarne ainsi de façon idéale le partenariat avec les milieux académiques et économiques. Et je ségrerai à M. le recteur Yves Lukiger d'avoir soutenu sans réserve la candidature à ce poste de son professeur. L'initiative dont je parle doit servir de levier pour renforcer la recherche de manière spécifique par le biais d'appels d'offres compétitifs. <coughs> Elle doit également mettre en place et développer de manière coordonnée au niveau national des plateformes infrastructurelles et logistiques pour assurer le transfert de connaissances et de technologies. Elle vise également à encourager la coopération internationale. Mesdames et messieurs, je sais très bien que les chercheuses et les chercheurs aimeraient pouvoir en faire davantage, qu'il s'agisse de quantum ou d'autres thèmes de recherche. Mais peu importe le niveau considéré, national, bilatéral, international, et peu importe aussi qu'il s'agisse de recherche bottom-up, de programmes suisses ou étrangers, ou encore d'infrastructures. Soyez certains de notre volonté d'offrir aux chercheurs suisses les meilleures conditions cadres possibles et le plus large éventail d'instruments pour que la place scientifique suisse reste le terreau fertile d'un essor appelé à être profitable à l'ensemble de la planète. Je vous félicite de votre engagement au service de Quantum et de votre intérêt pour l'avenir dans, dans ce domaine nous ouvre les portes. Je vous souhaite à toutes et à tous une bonne suite de soirée et vous remercie de votre attention. Merci, Monsieur le Conseiller fédéral, pour ces paroles. Je me joins aux salutations de notre recteur et je me permets de, de passer en, en anglais. I switch to English to welcome you all to the second part of the seventh on science and innovation. It is my pleasure to chair the session. 
we will, uh, through the different presentations, work in the field of quantum technologies, quantum materials, uh, quantum sensing, and quantum information. And most probably, during the round table, we will address some questions, issues related to quantum computing. Uh, we have, a, unfortunately, a very tight schedule. You can still ask question, questions on Slido uh, directly on the web page of the event, and some of these questions may be answered during the round table. I now give the floor to Professor Alberto Morpurgo, professor in the Department of Quantum Matter Physics and in the Group of Applied Physics at the University of Geneva who will tell us about the Geneva Quantum Center and who will then introduce uh, Professor Novozelov. Alberto, please. Merci, Jean-Marc. Uh, bon appétit midi à tout le monde. Um, I switch also to English and on behalf of all my colleagues, it is a pleasure to be given the, the opportunity to introduce the Geneva Quantum Center or, or the GQC as we normally call it. Um, you're hearing today that uh, quantum science has an immense potential to transform society. And now this is the result of decades of research carried out in laboratories all over the world. At the University of Geneva, we have a long-standing tradition in core domains of quantum sciences, such as quantum information, quantum materials, as well as in their theoretical foundations. Uh, because of our heavy involvement in quantum sciences, we have been having running discussion with 20 or so colleagues at the physics section over the last two years. And this discussion uh, have allowed us to identify our ambitions. And we have decided to put all our efforts together to fulfill these ambitions. And the G Geneva Quantum Center, the GQC, is the outcome of this process. So, so what, are our, what are these ambitions? Uh, in research, the ambition of the GQC is to develop new direction at the interfaces between the existing domains of quantum sciences, to explore territories that are scientifically unexplored. And we want to do that because there is where new discovery can be made. The quantum technology, it needs to be realized that the quantum technology that is emerging now is the result of research started many years ago. It is therefore now that we have to start looking for physical phenomena that will become important a few years in the future and will be the base of technology in a few years in the future. In teaching, um, we also have important ambition. We have just submitted to the Faculty of Sciences the proposal for a new master in quantum science and information. But we are convinced that it is essential to go beyond the university perimeter, and in particular, we need to prepare a new generation of engineers with a strong technical background in quantum technology. And that's, that is why we have just contacted the, the Haute École d'Ingénierie to start discussing ideas in this sense. Uh, as quantum technology is entering our society, we also want to share the knowledge that we have acquired over the course of many years during our research, and many GQC members would be happy to give their contribution to address societal issues, for instance, by getting involved in science-based decision-making processes whenever that is useful. Now, these goals are ambitious, and the GQC needs strong partners to fulfill them. Internationally, most GQC members have a strong and broad network of scientific collaboration that has been established through many years of work, and we'll connect this network to Geneva. But locally, the GQC aims at establishing strong partnership with all actors interested in quantum. These are CERN, we've heard here, JESDA, the Haute Code Ingenierie that I just mentioned, and now the Constructor University, uh, now that this partnership with the University of Geneva is becoming effective. This partnership, we think, will contribute to make Geneva a major hub for quantum science and technology. So this is what the GQC is about. And now let me move to the more scientific side of the event. Uh, and the talk that you will listen to today will probably give you an idea of some of the core domains uh, that, of research which are relevant in Geneva. On this note, I would like to invite Professor Konstantin Novozelov from the National University of, in Singapore and the University of Manchester in the UK to come over. 
Professor Novoselov needs no introduction. He discovered graphene in 2004, a discovery that has revolutionized the world of material physics and material sciences. For his discovery, Professor Novoselov shared the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics with Andrei Geim, and it is for me an immense pleasure to have Professor Novoselov here with us today. Kostya, please, the floor is yours. So, um, I, will, uh, I will switch to English even without starting with, in French, sorry about this. So it's really a great pleasure to, to, to be here back in, in Geneva. We had long, long-standing collaboration with uh, Alberto, with Alexei Kuzmenko over years. And it's actually, it's quite a good uh, connection to the Constructor University to, to, to talk about about materials, because materials actually link both uh, quantum and, uh, and, and AI applications, which, uh, which are quite strong in, in constructors. So I will try to cover both, both subjects in my, uh, in my talk today. So, but let me first start a uh, surprise surprise with, with, with graphene, and, and you will see uh, quite, quite regularly why is it a convenient point. So uh, graphene is, of course, it's, it's a very simple material. It's just a two-dimensional sheet of uh, carbon atoms arranged in a, in a honeycomb lattice. And, um, and uh, despite its simplicity, it actually has a number of unique uh, uh, Superlatives. It's the strongest material, it's the thinnest possible material, it's impermeable, most conductive, thermally conductive, and so on. And because of all those, all those unique properties, it's been uh, quite readily applied for a, a number of different applications from composites to, to energy, from optoelectronics to, uh, to sensors. And actually, quite possible that uh, you yourself today already touched graphene here or there, because every single Ford car these days would have graphene under its bonnet for, uh, for uh, high temperature resistive um, plastics, which also do noise, noise cancellation on the thermal management. There are uh, every single uh, Huawei phone would, would have um, uh, thermal management done with, with graphene because it's the only material which can give you 1,000 uh, watt meter Kelvin in terms of thermal conductivity. And then in terms of uh, uh, electronic applications, I think we are expecting some interesting uh, applications in terms of telecommunication because it's really it's the, one, of the, one of the possible solutions how to, uh, how to modulate signal in the, uh, in the optical domain. So, and um, some, uh, of course, uh, up to some time there was a question whether we can produce enough, uh, enough, uh, enough graphene these days, but uh, actually, uh, because a long time ago we, we started with the, with the mechanical exfoliation, you simply pick up your graphene from uh, as a monolayer of graphite. But, but these days um, you can find uh, a method which suits you for the mass scale pr production of, of this material, starting from CVD is the chemical vapor deposition. What you do, you simply run carbon containing uh, gas on top, of, uh, uh, on top of the surface of a hot metal, and then it just cracks on the surface. Carbon gets rearranged or into, into monolayer graphene, and then hydrogen flies away. And actually, this is quite an interesting topic. Let me just step aside a little bit and, and, and talk about uh, not only quantum or AI, but also some sustainability issues, as it has been already mentioned today. I'm sure that many of you have seen those pictures as the flares above the, uh, the, uh, the refinery plants all, all over the, the world. So you basically, oil companies simply burn carbon-containing gases, which are, which are the, the, the waste product of, the, of, the many, of, of many of those, uh, of those refineries. So, but there, 
we, we have both carbon containing gas and high temperature at the same time. So we basically, so to, to this end, we, we, we joined forces with our colleagues and uh, with some of my former students in, in, uh, in China, and we designed those reactors which, uh, which use both the heat and, uh, and uh, methane from those, from those flares. So now you can actually not only reduce the carbon emission and generate the, the, uh, the um, uh, useful carbon nanomaterial, but also offset your, uh, offset your um, carbon credits at the same time, which we also work with, the, with some of the blockchain companies to, 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 to register on, on the blockchain. But anyway, so just to, uh, to finish this, there, there are many, many areas, uh, there are many ways how to, you can produce graphene and then uh, depending on the particular application, you would use one, one or another. But then if you, if you just think that, okay, we can make graphene if we, if we use lead pencil. So can we, can we produce something else if we use some other pencils, some other colors? Uh, pencils? That, the answer is yes, we can. And actually, so the, the, these days, we, we, we don't talk about only graphene anymore. We actually talk about the full family of two-dimensional materials, and it's, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of, the, of, of, of different uh, members of this, of this family available to us now, uh, ranging from, say, most insulating to the most conductive, semiconductors, semi-metals, there are, there are superconductors, ferromagnets, you name it. So basically, it's of course uh, very tempting and it's very exciting to study the properties of, the, of nature in two dimensions, but also it gives us a new opportunity because we now can take those individual materials and then start constructing them uh, into, the, into a three-dimensional stack, into, into a material which never existed in nature before, but now we can control the properties of those materials with, uh, with atomic precision. And that's something which we do in, in our labs already now, already today, and I think it's going to be um, the dominant technology in the future because now we can create on-demand tailored materials with the predetermined properties, so properties which are exactly required for your, for your applications, including, including quantum. So there have been a number of new devices created with this technology, like tunneling transistors, like uh, solar cells, photodetectors, uh, light emitting uh, devices like, like here. So it's quite a complex heterostructure, which we need to make quite a, quite a, a complex tailored materials. But surprisingly, you just can start with individual layers, assemble it together, and then you get a light emitting uh, uh, um, device on your, uh, on your desk. So basically, it just really gives us a lot of opportunities in, in terms of creating new materials with novel properties which never existed before. And we have really a large number of, of, of knobs here to turn off, because you, have, you can choose any of the hundreds of those 2D materials when you assemble those stacks. You can choose the number of layers, the sequence of layers, and quite interestingly, you can actually even uh, even rotate those layers uh, with respect to each other. And and we were all very surprised that you can control the the properties in very broad range simply by rotating two layers next to each other by uh, by fraction of a degree. So just uh, just a few years ago, uh, there was a breakthrough from MIT, from Pablo's group, who, who, uh, do, who just simply by taking two layers of graphene and rotating them slightly obtained a super, uh, obtained superconductivity in, in carbon materials, something which is very unexpected unexpected, uh, unexpected um, uh, so even, even at the current stage. So, but this really gives us a lot of opportunities in terms of, uh, in, in, in terms of designing new quantum matter, whether useful for quantum, uh, for, uh, quantum technologies or not, we, we, we still don't know. But controlling those quantum, uh, 
quantum properties with very high precision is, uh, is a great opportunity and, and those two-dimensional materials are really one of the best uh, in, in, in terms of this, the, this, uh, this um, uh, in terms of such properties. Uh, I, I won't go too much into details just to, uh, to say that we, for example, can get um, by twisting, say, superconductors, we can we can create arrays of Josephson junctions, which we can which you can, uh, for example, use uh, for uh, to create new quantum states, maybe possibly useful for for uh, for quantum computers. However, at this moment, let me now switch gears and, uh, so as promised from my from the title of, of my talk, look a little bit into the future. So already now, so what we do, we create, can create materials, tailored materials with the predetermined properties. But what do you actually want from materials in general? So if you would have a wild card, well, what 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 would you request from uh, from from your materials? Say. Um, so just let me show you just one uh, one um, one uh, short clip. I'm sure many of the of people in the audience would recognize this. It's uh, of course it terminated two movies. So it's uh, the for those who haven't seen it, uh, try to see it. But uh, but the 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 plot is basically that the robot from 2029 travels to 1991 to kill Sarah Connor and her and her son. I'm not going to, so I'm not, I'm not going to go m m much further in, into details. The only reason I'm showing it to you is because uh, that's how people in 91 dreamed about future robots. So they should be made from liquid metal, change in shape, be agile, uh, be, be able to self-repair, and, uh, and so on. So now we are in 2022, and fortunately, I, I've got, I've got bad, bad news for you that doesn't matter how much improvements can we make for, with, those, with those robots, we're, we're not going to fulfill the dreams of the director of Terminator 2 movies. So we really have, have to do something different. And the problem is that uh, generally our technology is, is, uh, has this limitation of being top down. It means that individual components, so we are in the watch, in the watch making city, right? So individual components are completely non-functional. So the, the, the functionality comes only when you assemble those components into, into, into a system. And it's true not only robotics or the, or the watchmaking, it's actually true about all our, uh, all, all our technologies in general, like electronics, energy, uh, and so on. So now let's, um, uh, but if you think about nature, it actually works on a completely different pretense. So there, the functionality is spread across all possible levels of complexity. So individual proteins, they're functional in their own right. So you don't need to think that, like, okay, my, I want my, uh, that protein to unfold, take oxygen, just move it somewhere else, and, uh, and so on. So it, it, is, it is done on the protein level. Uh, so, um, in the, um, uh, the uh, membranes of, of cells, they have their, their own functionality, so they know what to do. The cells themselves, the organs, uh, and so on. So, the question is, can we actually try to learn from, from, from nature and try to design materials and bring some of the functionality from the system level down to the, down to the material level? And then, then we start talking about functional intelligent materials, functional meaning that they can be programmed to perform a specific uh, response to external stimuli and intelligent, uh, well, there are many ways how to define in intelligence. So we can, let's say we, we just, at least we want that they can remember something, some, some state, so they have some memory function. So let me just give you one example what we can, what, what we would like to, to achieve. So um, graphene membranes, for example, they are used for uh, water desalination. So in, in, uh, in Singapore, 100% uh, of water is coming from, uh, from, those, uh, desalination, uh, from those desalination plants. So, uh, so graphene can, can, uh, can, uh, can, uh, can be used there, but then 
doesn't matter which, which membranes they use, you always have to control the quality of water. So you put a sensor there after the membrane, the sensor tests the quality of water, sends the signal to the computer, computer analyzes it. If there are no toxins there, it just it's, it, it sends a signal to the valve, so to open or close the water stream. Imagine if we can, um, if we can drop all those functions on the membrane itself. So it, it has some sensing capabilities for the presence of uh, cert certain toxic species, then, uh, then it can change its, its, its conformation and uh, open or close the, 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 the water stream. So we have, so the, the material itself would be perform the sensing function, the, uh, anal the analyzing function, and then the, the, the actuator function as well. And I'll talk about the, the other one, uh, or the, the other example later. So, and we, we do know uh, roughly how, how those materials need to be constructed, so it's very difficult to, to, um, to predict the, 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 um, the structure of those materials, because if you want the material to have memory, it needs to be uh, to, to, to be created in, in a metastable state. And we are really very, very bad to describe the, uh, materials in metastable states. But at least from the practical uh, approach, we know how, the, how they, they need to be constructed. So we want them to, to, to be a composite materials with strong interaction between components. But then this, this interaction should be uh, coming from multi-scale, so at the end, so like that they would in interact through Coulomb, through, through, um, through elastic uh, energy, through one the valves, chemical, and, uh, and so on. And then you can actually create those materials in a so-called degenerate energy landscape, like, uh, like, like glasses. And then you can navigate from one metastable state into, into another through just small stimuli. And then you can actually create some active material. It's not really a new idea, because uh, our, the, so the proteins in our body they actually operate exactly in this, in this manner. Because because there are so many ways to fold a protein. There are, so those proteins exist in many metastable states. And then, and then if you can learn how to, through which signals you can, you, you can move from one state to another, you can, you can control this, this uh, system and you can extract some useful functionalities. So unfortunately, as I said already, it's really very, uh, difficult to predict the, the properties of such, of such materials because our traditional formalism like um, quantum mechanics, DFT, and so on, they, they don't give us ability to uh, simulate or to predict metastable states. You really have to, to do a lot of tricks to uh, describe a system in a, in a glassy state. And to that uh, and dynamic machine learning and uh, machine learning in, in general uh, give us some, uh, might give us some, uh, some uh, opportunities. Of course, it ha we have to produce a lot of data, so you need uh, robotic labs for, for that. But in principle, if you fulfill all those requirements, you might be able to succeed. So I just wanted to, to, to give you, so at the end of my talk, I wanted to give you just a few examples of where AI traditional AI and dynamic AI can, can help us in terms of creation of both quantum and, um, and functional and intelligent material. So I spoke before about those, those uh, LEDs created by, this, by, by those two-dimensional heterostructures. And it works well. And actually, because we have so many of those crystals, we cover quite a big range of, uh, range of spectrum. But big means that it doesn't mean that, that, that we cover everything. Actually, we do, we, we do want to create uh, tailored crystals to cover just any arbitrary wavelengths and any arbitrary color which you which you want and we do it by the by the creation of uh, of of alloys so we will have those uh, machines which with which with the with some feedback the technology can can 
can create a particular alloy, but even to predict the uh, the 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 properties of those alloys is quite a, is quite a challenge. So we know that we can cover the whole spectrum, but we but, but it's very difficult to predict in advance which which color you are going to get. So um, and uh, so those alloys that, that, that would have a lot of applications. So for example, in uh, in in catalysis, so we can control the, the the catalytic properties and efficiency by 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 creating those alloys, and even on the simplest possible way, like single atom. So it's not really alloy; it's just it just it just doping. Which you, so those single defects can be used as uh, as uh, uh, as quantum emitters, which is useful for for quantum telecommunication, but even on that, on that level, it's very difficult for us to predict which particular defect with which symmetry would give us the, 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 uh, the uh, particular uh, single photon properties. So, and to that end, uh, um, uh, AI based uh, full, uh, based on the on the library of those uh, individual defects helps helps a lot. So so these days we have we have libraries of tens of thousands of different defects in different in different materials, and then of course uh, with the with uh, by combining those defects, so multiples of them, you can simulate any any alloy you want or any complex uh, complex. Uh, uh, defect you want, either for 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 catalysis applications or for light emission or for uh, for uh, for uh, single photon emitters. So of course you you have to put some quantum information inside of this of this AI, but at the end of the day it works it works uh, beautifully well. So and actually that database is, is available online for for everybody. I just welcome you to to, to use it. Now uh, on the dynamic uh, on the dynamic AI. So it also it also proven to be to, to be able to work. So we, we we test it now on some simpler systems. Say on not on on uh, on uh, uh, on proteins but on simpler polymer chains but now we can if we show our AI which is based on the Ansaga model how to uh, how to stretch and how to collapse a polymer chain then it can learn not only learn the behavior but learn the effective potential and uh, effective coordinates so it basically creates uh, um, custom thermodynamics for for this for, for this complex system, and then we can predict the the uh, the uh, the properties, the folding and unfolding properties of this polymer chain. But even better, we can find ways how to control the way this this folding goes, and that's already moves towards the towards this goal of controlling folding and 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 unfolding of the proteins. And just to say that those dynamic. Uh, systems they're not limited to proteins alone so here is um, really a beautiful example of the designer material with the designed dynamic properties so it's the high entropy alloys and it was designed in such a way to to that it can it can heal itself so we just so what we did here we just drilled a hole that that's the hole in the middle and then if you add it if you give it a little bit of 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 energy you can stimulate the transfer of the entropy uh, uh, part of the free energy which is stored in this high entropy alloy into into entropy and then it just heals itself completely and that's and unfortunately the only way how to simulate and predict the properties of such a material is through uh, through AI and dynamic AI. DFT won't help at all. So here is another uh, example of a um, dynamic system which we are trying to simulate with with machine learning. So we we but by using bacteria which can emit uh, emit electron, we 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 combine it with uh, with conductive polymers and uh, and uh, uh, and graphene foam, and then we can collect this electron and send it into the into the uh, external external circuit. So basically, you create a, a biological fuel cell. 
But now it's a quite a complex system because, of course, those bacteria constantly divide and, uh, and grow. And then, but, but, this, but, but the polymer chain, when it collects electrons, it helps to, it, uh, uh, those electrons help, help to, to polymerize those polymers from, from, from monomers. So it's a dynamic system. You just put one, one bacteria there, a lot of monomers, add some sugar or lactose, then, then it just grows, grows by itself. There is absolutely no chance we can, um, we can uh, simulate it with the, with the, uh, with the, uh, with, with the, with the traditional, uh, even multi-scale modeling. AI works much, much better in this, in this respect. So I think I will, I will stop here and I will say that I was just to, to repeat that uh, we have now a lot of opportunities to create novel quantum materials using, uh, using uh, the, the technology of tailored materials, materials with the predetermined properties, but even more interesting, we should be able to, uh, to design and create smart materials, functional materials for future smart applications. Thank you so much for your, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Novozela, for this uh, very inspiring talk on these fascinating 2D materials and for sharing with us your views of the future. Uh, for the next talk, we have a small change in the program. We will have first uh, Serge Bell, who is the founder of uh, SIT and Constructor University. And Serge Bell will share with us his views of uh, the development of quantum technologies. So uh, Serge Bell will be with us uh, online by Zoom. Serge, the floor is yours. So I'm going to be very quick because we're a little bit late uh, today with the agenda. So I'm going to talk in general about uh, Constructor University. Uh, so first of all, it is very clear that uh, the world is full of problems. Uh, aging and disease is something which I'm dealing with today myself, and that's why I'm not in person. Poverty and social justice, very common topic in uh, Geneva. Environment and sustainability, another common topic, which is very familiar to everybody. And uh, wars and violence, <clears throat> which is clearly something which is very dear to everybody in Europe right now. And uh, uh, also, uh, of course, uh, uh, space and universe challenges, uh, which is uh, also very clear. If you know enough about science, you understand that uh, Earth is not sufficient for humanity for the next 1,000, 1 million years, no matter what we do. And it makes sense to explore the universe. Uh, we know that the main way to solve uh, problems is uh, science. Science is a source of knowledge, and knowledge is a solution against all evil. But uh, we also know that <coughs> that uh, uh, that uh, I'm sorry, I have quite a bit of echo here. Um, I mean, I'm getting feedback from my team. I'm not sure how to control it. Right, maybe this way will, will be better. Uh, but uh, the effect of the matter is that uh, the science uh, we know today is just the beginning of uh, infinite uh, search for science. There is many, many things which are in science which are still not known to uh, us today. For example, in physics, uh, there are more unknowns today than the war uh, 50 years ago, such as a unified theory of quantum mechanics and gravity, dark matter, and why do we have so much of it? Uh, what is time, which is a topic which is um, subtly touched by uh, some of the uh, members of the University of Geneva, such as Nicolas Zuzan. What is scale, which is a related topic, because we all assume that things are local, not local, but if we don't know what is time, we actually really don't know what is distance uh, and so on. There is a lot of topics in machine intelligence, uh, which uh, are uh, basically discussing how far can you reach with machine intelligence, 
there is uh, a lot of uh, topics related to generally the reach of life. How long can life be extended? Um, what is the limit of the possible e existence of a single um, living organism? Uh, we definitely don't know how brain works today and where software in the brain becomes hardware. And there are discussions even whether we have classical physics and sort of classical part of physics and chemistry and biology applied to our brain and whether it's a classical machine, Turing machine or it's something more. And some of the recent Nobel Prize winners uh, actually have a strong opinion that we brain is non-classical device. And we also, and this is my personal favorite, don't really understand the connection between uh, sort of platonic uh, sphere of knowledge uh, where uh, we have uh, knowledge actually affecting physical world. You can observe the, uh, say, one uh, cubical light year of uh, the universe. And if there is knowledge inside, the observations will be quite a bit different. And with that, <clears throat> we know that uh, life is a knowledge creating um, uh, mechanism and humans as a knowledge creating species. And you have this very sort of special evolution, which can be seen as an evolution of species, but it's also an evolution of knowledge. So the first knowledge transfer uh, have been started with uh, bacteria, and then uh, we get more sophisticated, um, uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, organisms such as vertebrates with basic instincts. Uh, we have uh, social behavior uh, by higher animals. Some elements of learning, some elements of uh, names, some <coughs> cross generation. Uh, knowledge passed apart from DNA. Uh, then, of course, we have um, definitely learning in dolphins, primates, and since we recently learned, uh, as in the background uh, photo, uh, in um, octopuses. Uh, and and of course, there is there is a very special feature of humans that we can create explanatory knowledge. Uh, we can create the knowledge which can pass generations. Um, then, with that. We definitely uh, can see that there is many things we don't understand about one of the most mysterious objects in the universe, uh, probably the most mysterious object in the universe today, which is human brain. So first of all, we definitely know that different humans have different compute memory and communication capacity. Uh, they can communicate faster, slower, learn faster, slower, uh, store more and less information in different forms compute since faster or lower, but we don't exactly understand how this works. I mean, the brain is a chemical, biological, electrical machine. Now then we have four phenomena which are still very much not known to us. Uh, you know, some of them are very much attempted to be studied very much in the same city in Geneva, consciousness. What is consciousness specifically, uh, which is, uh, you know, feature of not just humans, but also other species. Free will, does it exist? What's the role of free will in physics? Uh, intuition, and, and as such scientific intuition. Uh, what is intuition? Can we sort of uh, implement intuition-like behaviors in machine intelligence? And for sure, based on the all of the previous things, we don't understand creativity. So there is definitely a connection between, for example, compute memory and communication capacity and creativity, but it's not very defined connection. And, and so what is creative thinking? Is it just trial and error type thinking where we just attempt in our brain very quickly to go through various mistaken variants? We don't know this. Now, it is very clear that humans can be assisted by machines. And there are huge differences between machines and humans uh, differences which make machines a unique complement to human brain at the very least. So first of all, machines are potentially billion times faster per instruction. So you can make uh, photonic chips which can run at terahertz speed. And, and that is definitely just an engineering uh, challenge. There is not uh, any kind of difficult science to overcome 
you can also have much more memory today human brain stores in some form 2.5 petabytes of information this of course is a very very general statement uh, because we don't know precisely how the information is stored and it's sort of pseudo stored in the brain it's a very special kind of storage but there is uh, 100 zettabytes more than 50 40 million more uh, data on a world wide web and and that number will grow more than 10 times in less than 10 years there is also much faster communications uh, with uh, the machine, which is possible. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, in, in our pipeline startups, which are talking about 30 terabytes per second communication of a single fiber. And so you can sort of load the brain in, in uh, right around 100 seconds. Um, then, of course, uh, in the brain, we have 86 billion neurons, and that sounded like a lot, but on the modern neuromorphic type chips like Cerebras, you have 30 trillion transistors. Of course, one transistor is not the same as a single neuron, but definitely you can create a neural network with many more emulations of uh, transistor or of uh, neurons than you can have in human brain. More importantly, there are some mechanisms which are appealing in the near future, uh, such as quantum computing, which we in constructor uh, group predict to be um, uh, happening uh, to 1 million qubits in less than 10 years, um, which are not uh, allowing computations which are not even possible in human brain. And so we don't know the limit of those computations. And one of the unique features of human brain is effectively emulating the universe. In fact, the universe exists in your brain, but in not very precise classical um, image. Now, with a quantum computer, you can emulate it much better and much closer to how it behaves. With that, we see tremendous advantage, advances in machine intelligence over the past three years, and specifically over the past uh, one year in creative um, uh, activities. First of all, for sure, any game uh, can be won with machine intelligence. Any game, or almost any game today, uh, you can get uh, machine intelligence to learn how to play and to learn how to master it and to be creative in winning. And, and so for sure, if you talk about limited number of rules, you can uh, be uh, confident with machine intelligence, be more creative than humans. Then uh, you can uh, have machine intelligence now writing code significantly better in, in than some humans and faster for sure. It can create art, which is um, reasonably difficult to uh, distinguish from human created art, some of it reasonably creative. It can solve mathematical problems. Again, if you talk about all these problems which you get in school, uh, there is a major difference in them in comparison to scientific problems is that they are <clears throat> limited in the need for creativity, but still, and then uh, most recently you can do such very useful scientific activity, which is a key to many of the problems facing humanity, such as protein folding. Of course, not all of the proteins, but very well. Now, there are many challenges with machine intelligence. And um, in many ways, I'm talking to scientists in different universities in different countries uh, about this topic of the last 10 years. And less and less, but even today, I continue to meet the snobbish uh, approach to this. And, and basically, I, I think um, there is definitely things to do in machine intelligence. One of them is we continuously create better and better hardware. The hardware for machine intelligence uh, have improved its performance, uh, you know, millions of times over the past uh, 10 years uh, because of generation of new level chips. There is also a lot of open source, closed source, uh, um, middleware, which allows to use that hardware in abstract and better way. There is much better interfaces lowering the barrier of using machine intelligence for different research and scientific activities. And there are many islands of usage of machine intelligence for science, particularly, for example, in the medical field. Uh, now, um, I think the uh, perfect machine intelligence of the future should be able to come up with explanatory 
uh, theories. So, for example, at the very least, maybe it can come up with the theories we use today, such as uh, uh, general theory of relativity or of quantum mechanics, based on facts it would know. Uh, not today, right? And we, we don't have, know such examples. In the future, maybe it can come up with new theories. And we believe for that, you need to teach machine to do science and to learn science. And we believe for that, we need some form of uh, special language and formalism. Voice, pictures, pictograms, natural language are not ideal way to communicate with machines. Symbolic languages, like some of the languages of mathematics, were not designed to communicate with machines about science. And today, we primarily communicate with machine intelligence using programming languages like, such as Python. That is not ideal as well. And so on that note, I will pass the microphone to my colleague, Andrei Ustujanin, who will talk about um, what we think could be applied to machine intelligence and science. Um, yeah, hello everyone. So I'm uh, happy to be uh, Sergey's avatar for this part of presentation. Uh, Sergey, do you hear me? So you could switch the slides. Yes, I hear you now. Okay, uh, perfect. So this would be a very brief and very uh, concise. Um, list of pointers, so list of portals, if you want, towards the development that is, is going on currently in, in uh, our university and in the broader scale, like in uh, all field of science, right? And oh, I, I guess we need to, to wait for the slides <laughs> for Sergey to reconnect. Uh, meanwhile, uh, so this, this is just an overview that actually um, give some hints that I, I, would be, I would like to engage you to follow uh, if you're interested in the main idea, the main um, development, like how, how we can design artificial intelligence that would be aligned with the physical models that we are building in various, in various domains. So um, this is actually one of the... Um, one of the building blocks, one of the uh, like mathematical structure that is currently being developed and active, started to develop quite actively uh, recently in applied sense, which is called category theory. Uh, so it has a very um, nice description of the structure that you can get um, out of the relations between entities. So in, in, in contrast with set theory, when you look into the properties of collections in category theory, you look how one thing is related to all the rest world. And it actually turns out to be quite, um, quite successful perspective that allows you to analyze different domains in this, using the same language. So um, there are many properties that, that you can explore in categories. For example, you, you might be asking questions how one category is structured in terms of uh, relations inside of it, but also how these categories actually relate to other categories, and you can instantly move to a meta level that uh, gives you much more interesting results, and uh, this was the, the main uh, idea why it was designed and developed. So the next slide. Uh, you, can, you can switch uh, the next one. Uh, give some examples how, what kind of uh, categories you can, you can think, um, like a partial order that, that just shows how numbers relate to each other, uh, which, which one is bigger of, of others. And uh, it could be a set category, or it could be a co computational category essentially comprising all kind of programs that you can write using a Turing machine or lambda calculus, so uh, in, in sequential way. So, and, and domains actually grow quite, quite rapidly. So the next slide um, shows even more examples how different notations actually fit into the same uh, branch of the same uh, logic of description of the domains. It, it could be as simple as um, different braids, or it could be um, a notation of chemical reactions, or it could be uh, parametric lenses that, that uh, relate several information flows together. Or it could be even evolution 
that, that you can see on the, on the bottom, uh, if, if uh, on the next slide, shows how you can, for example, describe uh, why tigers have stripes while lions do not have. Like the answer is if you take into account something bigger context uh, that, that is environment uh, that would allow you to understand better why, uh, pre pre uh, why predators in one field adapted and changed their genetic structure. So the next slide uh, shows the uh, mapping or Rosetta Stone like uh, the, the artifact that was discovered many years ago and contains all the same text in different languages like uh, Egyptian and, and Greek and allow to decrypt uh, Egyptian uh, inscriptions, uh, the, the mapping between different domains allows you to find the relations between each other, one and another. So if, if uh, yeah, we look at the different verticals in these tables that uh, shows relation between, say, physics and logic and computation uh, allows you to map the, the entities in those domains to category theory. So you can construct a category that would contain description of exactly the same physics or exactly the same computations. Uh, so it's very helpful if you want to look at different uh, perspectives uh, at the same things that happening at uh, different domains. So uh, switching to the next slide uh, shows one of the so-called main secret of mathematicians uh, that, that basically explains how you can compare things. And instead of comparing them by looking at internals, you can look at the relations. And if relations between two different objects are the same, it means that those objects uh, can be treated identically up to a certain isomorphism. And uh, we have in our everyday life examples like in physics, when you want to analyze structure of a material, you take a spectrum. If you want to understand what is uh, happening in the consciousness of a human, you can compare behaviors of, of two people. Or in linguistic, you can look at the neighbors of every word and it take you much better what is the meaning of, each, of this world, of this word. So the next slide uh, shows uh, application of category theory to completely uh, separate domain. Uh, that is topological uh, quantum field theory, topological phase matter, uh, which studies certain properties of material that is quite uh, different from what people studied before. And in, the, in this domain, uh, what what is uh, actually plays the important role is how you change this the, the position of individual elements, and you can decode these positions uh, by uh, braided structures like a, like a tying knots on strings. So the next slide shows uh, the how you can relate physics with those topology and with computations. Uh, Sergey, next slide, please. Um, so it's schematically builds a correspondence between those three different domains. Uh, so switching gates or turning on gates, you can switch uh, properties of matter. And it was uh, shown how it can be uh, useful practically in the paper by the link. And uh, so if you take a bigger picture, and next slide, tries to de depict it in very, um, very high level view. So if we, have a, if we have a system that is simulated or collected from a data from experiments, we can map this system into some kind of physical process description. Or at the same time, uh, in, the, in this categorical view, we can uh, map it to some kind of artificial intelligence system. And we, if we find a good mapping between those two categories, then we can uh, can have a hope to build a more uh, sophisticated machine learning models. And at the same time, we can map both into the computational fields, like quantum computations or classic computations that would allow you to uh, perform, or re perform uh, a quantitative assessment in a more efficient way. So uh, one, one thing that we have to deal, looking at this picture, be, uh, how to deal with the multitude of different processes that happen inside the category, for example, physics category, because 
it, it, it potentially can be rather versatile or but rather uh, rich. So one way how to regularize these things uh, uh, is, is actually uh, taking into account some principles or some invariants. So next slide just illustrates uh, some of those uh, principles like Noether theorems, or it could be some, some other principles from informational theory of you. So uh, the, the, th the theory or more systematic approach that allow you to deal with those principles is called constructor theory. Uh, the next slide briefly outlines uh, what it is all about, and it starts with the notion of constructor as a machine that uh, is actually allow you to perform certain tasks without uh, violating laws of nature. Uh, so uh, using this notion, it's, it's very similar to the constructing proof, construct, constructing proof of mathematical theorems. Uh, so the next slide shows um, a few examples of uh, already um, developed foundation, developed principles in, in, in different fields uh, by David Deutsch and his group. Um, and, and the practical applications of this approach is depicted on the next slide um, that, that shows how you can demonstrate a ver irreversibility of some physical process in thermodynamics or quantum dynamics, quantum systems. So um, this actually brings to the uh, almost final slide um, that shows how we can find the interplay between category theory and uh, constructor theory. So in, in that sense, constructor theory just regularizes us in the selection of what possible or impossible uh, process we, that we can encode using our categorical notation. So it shows what is uh, meaningful and what is not a priori without spending computational efforts on this. So um, this basically brings me to the final slide, um, and I wanted to wrap up that the uh, foundation for building the, uh, the formalism that allow you to bridge the gap between a domain of un under study and machine intelligence and computations in, in more general, things should be uh, founded or should be supported by math or some development in math, in particular category theory. Um, that plays nicely with some regulations and some regularization that is provided by constructor theory. So this was basically the sketch um, that we wanted to share in this context. Thank you very much for your attention, Sergey. Uh, please. Uh, yeah, th this is just a slide for references that you can uh, grab for your own consideration. Thank you very much. Yes. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I was told that apparently uh, it is not the speech which the audience, you know, expected. And, and so supposing I, I need to make a different speech, I just uh, am going to wrap it up short because it's a bit of a difficult day for me. Just uh, maybe we all remember that there is uh, several things which are important about scientific discussions and conferences that these are places where people can express their opinion, discuss them, and not be upset about different content. But I will follow the recommendation, it will be short, and, and go through this really quickly. So not really present my last part. I guess it's good that I'm not there. And the point is, uh, we are very happy to cooperate with uh, University of Geneva. And we hope that cooperation will be significantly better organized than the process of getting into this cooperation. And we definitely believe that quantum computing, communication, and uh, uh, you know, sensing is an important part of science. And it's an important part of overall making science better. And so hope we can do more with you guys. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for this presentation. We go back to our program uh, with a presentation of Wolfgang Titel, who is a professor at the University of Geneva and at Constructor University. And uh, Wolfgang Titel, will tell us about challenges 
in quantum communication. Wolfgang, please. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Good evening, bonsoir. Monsieur le Conseiller fédéral, Monsieur le Président du Conseil d'État, Monsieur le Président du Grand Conseil, Monsieur le Recteur, dear Sag Bell, dear Alberto Di Meglio, dear audience, it's a great pleasure that I stand in front of you today to discuss some of the promises of the second quantum revolution and to celebrate as well the start of a new venture between the University of Geneva and between Constructor University. Um, this partnership will further accelerate the research and the development of technology in the area of quantum communication, an area in which the University of Geneva, and more precisely, its group of applied physics, has made many seminal contributions since almost 30 years. I would like to take this opportunity as well to thank all those who have been involved in creating this new partnership, including those who have initiated it, including those who have shaped it, and including also though all those who have diligently worked in the background and may get a little bit less visibility than the others. Thank you. I would like to start with a question. Have you ever asked yourself which technological development during the past couple of decades has had the biggest impact on our lifestyle? I think it is the internet. There is no day anymore, and for many of us, including myself, the time span is much, much shorter, where we don't write emails, where we don't look up information online, where we don't fill out online forms, or we don't use the latest social media platform to communicate with our fans or those that would like to be our fans. Um, the exchange of information across the internet is based on bits, a logical system that can take on two different values, generally labeled zero and one, and such a bit can be represented in very different ways depending on where we use it. If you think about computation, it is often the voltage at the input or at the output of a gate. If we think about communication, it can be a pulse of light of two different intensities. Surprisingly, something very interesting happens as we encode information not anymore in a macroscopic system like a strong pulse of light, but as we encode it into a very weak pulse of light, a pulse of light that may encode only, include only a single photon. It turns out that in that case, information can still be encoded in terms of bits, zero and one, but we have much more possibilities. We actually deal with quantum bits here right now. We can also encode information in what we call superpositions of zero and one. And very surprisingly, these superpositions, in a way, being at the same time zero and one, come with different signs. They can be zero plus one and zero minus one. For a single photon, this can be achieved, for instance, by emitting it from a complex optical circuit at two different times. With the early time, maybe encoding a zero, and what you see there is a quantum mechanical notion of a zero, but you can think of it almost like as a bit zero. Or you can say we would like to have the single photon in the bit one, in which case we emit it a little bit later. Interestingly, we can also create a circuit that emits that photon at the same time, early on later, in a superposition of early and later. If I think about a single atom, well, I can think of different energy levels of that atom as zeros and ones. But I can also prepare a single atom by, in by interacting with it with a light pulse in a superposition of being at the same time in two different energy levels. Even more surprisingly, we can think about an electronic circuit in which current can, can flow clockwise or counterclockwise, but it can actually also flow in both directions at the same time. If you find this non-intuitive, well, it gets weirder. We can also take two quantum systems, and we can prepare them such that they're both in the same state, either both zero or both one. But surprisingly, quantum mechanics also allows us to prepare them such that they are either, or at the same time, both in state zero and both in state one. These are those famous entangled states that have been mentioned already a, kind, a couple of times during this lecture. Now, if I take one of these two photons and send it to the right, and I take the other one and send it to the left, and I make measurements with these photons, I send them on a semi-transparent mirror, and I look whether they are transmitted or reflected, and I assign zeros and ones to these different outcomes. It turns out, in this case, that I will always find the same outcome for the two photons, even though both react completely randomly upon this measurement. And you can think of this a little bit like two coin flips. 
where each coin will obviously fall randomly on heads or tails, but if I compare the outcome of these two coin flips, I see that both coins always fall on the same side. How is that possible? Is that actually true? Well, this was, of course, a very important question, which required verification, and these tests have often been done, or in the beginning always been done, with pairs of photons. And well, it turns out that you can actually demonstrate the existence of entanglement in the lab, and what you see on the top left, uh, there is a glitch in the presentation, what you see on the top left is supposed a laboratory in France where entanglement or non-locality, which was closely related, or is closely related to it, was demonstrated firstly very convincingly in 1982. <coughs> on the bottom left, you see an experiment that we have done here in Geneva, not in 2017, as wrongly indicated there, but in 1997, um, where we showed for the first time entanglement outside the lab. And on top right, you see an image of a satellite that was used to generate pairs of entangled photons, which were then sent down to two ground stations in China to demonstrate entanglement in 2017 between two positions, two locations that were more than 1,000 kilometers apart. So the idea or the fact that entanglement is actually real, that you can demonstrate it, was so important that it was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics this year to Alain Aspe, John Clauser, and Anton Seilinger, who have made similar contributions to the demonstration of entanglement and its establishment. What is arguably as fascinating as the fact that entanglement exists is that it opens the path to fundamentally more powerful applications, which derive their benefits from encoding information into quantum bits and entangled quantum bits, as opposed to classical standard bits. And these applications have impact on communication, on sensing, and on, on computing. Yeah, so it, is, it turns out it is possible to create secret keys for encryption purposes by sending photons over optical fibers or satellite-based links. It turns out that you can improve the resolution of a magnet magnetometer, which senses tiny magnetic fields, by using entangled states. And it turns out that you can actually run computations that are infeasible with a classical computer in shorter time, in non-exponential time, on a quantum computer. Let us focus on the example of secret key distribution as the prime example in quantum communications. And let's suppose right now that we have established, we have managed to establish entangled photons between two partners, Alice and Bob. Well, I've told you already that the measurement of these two photons would lead to perfectly correlated results. Now, I can repeat this measurement many times, and what I, do by doing, what I get by doing that is a sequence of bits that are identical, which is indicated in the slide here. What is more is that these sequences of bits, bits are private. And this refers or is due to a property of entanglement that we call monogamy. Monogamy. Here we go. <laughs> so this tells us that if we have two systems that are perfectly entangled, it is impossible for a third system that is held by an eavesdropper to be entangled with these two systems as well. And practically, it means that it is impossible for anybody else to get information about the sequences of bits that are shared by Alice and Bob. And now, if we know that we share sequences of identical bits, and nobody else knows anything about those, well, then we can use these bits, combine them with a known algorithm with a confidential message, and then we can send this message to our partner, being sure that nobody else can read it. Systems that allow the distribution of secret keys based on quantum physical properties, so-called quantum key distribution systems, already exist, in particular at the local company ED Contique, which is just a few hundred meters down the road. But a lot of work still has to be done to make sure that quantum key distribution and other primitives of quantum communications meet their actual promise. And the most important task, and that brings me back to the title of this talk, is that we have to be able to generate entanglement over much longer distances than the couple of tens of kilometers or maybe of 100 kilometers that we can do today. The most important task is what we refer to as the quantum internet which eventually will allow us to send, to create entangled particles across Europe or maybe even across the entire planet. So what is the difficult part there? Well, if you would like to send a photon from here to there, let's say from Madrid to Paris, um, the distance is way too long. Photons would get lost on the way. 
But what we can do is to split this long distance into shorter distances, so-called elementary links, and we can establish entanglement across each of these elementary links, and this is on the top left, which I try to uh, indicate with these three following horizontal lines. This is still a probabilistic process, but if it works, well, we can add quantum memories, little hard disks, not for your emails, but for quantum mails, for photons that are entangled, that allow us to store entanglement established across these elementary links. And if we have been successful to establish entanglement across all these links, well, then we can make a measurement that connects entanglement across neighboring links and thereby entangle the most outwards memories and thereby create entanglement on a global scale, which then we can use for quantum key distribution. We can use this also for other applications of quantum communications. We can think about network quantum computing. Similar like our classical computers that are much more powerful by being con connected into a network, we expect something similar to happen with quantum computers. We can also think about having a quantum mainframe somewhere, a computer that is far away, and we could actually use it by encrypting the, the task that you want the computer to calculate using quantum encryption and quantum entanglement in a way that nobody, and not even the computer, knows what is actually calculating. Yeah. Similarly, we can connect optical sensors. We could, for instance, think about connecting two optical telescopes that collect light from distant stars, bring the light together using quantum repeater technology, make a measurement there, and thereby improve and increase the accuracy or the resolution of these individual telescopes to the resolution the telescope would have with the diameter corresponding to the distance between these two telescopic systems. Building such a quantum internet is a huge task. And that is, in large part, because of the, of the large number of different technologies that have to come together. Yeah, we need single atoms or ions, single quantum systems, that allow us to emit photons or entangled photons, and that also allow creating, well, computing, uh, quantum computing by interacting with each other. We also need large ensembles of ions or atoms that allow us to store many photons that are traveling across elementary links in order to create an efficient quantum repeater. We have to think about the photons that were used for traveling. Yeah, they have to be able to interact with these different systems for memory and for those um, atoms that actually allow us to do the calculation. Um, we need to make sure these photons are compatible with a high transparency window in optical fibers, and we also have to make sure that these photons are compatible with free space links that may send them up to a satellite, to another satellite, and then back down to the Earth. So a lot of different technologies that we need to make compatible. We have to make sure that we have the same wavelength, the same bandwidth, but we also have to make sure that elements that are operating next to each other can operate in the same conditions. It doesn't make sense to develop elements where one of those um, is operating at, 270, at minus 270 Kelvin and the neighboring element requires plus 100 um, at minus 270 Celsius and the element next to it is operating at 100 Celsius. Yeah, so we have to look into compatibility. We also have to look into integration of these elements on chip. We have to look at, scalable, at scalability and all that which is hardware, we also have to supplement this by creating software to control all this. Uh, we have to think about standardization, certification, and finally, training of the future workhorse, because it turns out, with a very, very rapidly growing number of companies that start investing into quantum technology in general, well, there is a lack of workforce, and this is certainly a big task that the universities have to think about for the future. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, for sharing with us the fascinating properties of uh, that allow uh, entanglement. So we will finish this event with a roundtable uh, with quantum entrepreneurs. And this roundtable will be moderated by uh, Nicolas Gisin, who is an honorary professor at the University of Geneva and professor at Constructor University. So I'm calling Nicolas Gisin and uh, the participants of the roundtable. Please, Nicolas.
Okay, so thank you for, for those who are still with us. Uh, the idea of the round table, why, why, why should we have now a panel? Uh, we talked a lot about quantum promises, that's the title, and uh, we wanted to show you that these promises are not just uh, fantasy, they are partly fantasy, but they're also partly quite concrete. And uh, to make it concrete, uh, we wanted to show to you real people that are behind real businesses, existing businesses, many startups here. I, don't, I didn't really count how many startups, quantum startups there are worldwide, but I guess we are not far from a thousand. There are really many, and, uh, and it's growing. Uh, almost every day you have a few more. Of course, many of them will not survive. That's okay, that's part of being a, a startup. But some of them, are really going to shape our future. And uh, again, in order to make these promises a bit more concrete, uh, we wanted to have just a, a few of them. We have some on the stage, we have also some on, the, um, on Zoom. You, you, okay, there, anyway, maybe they'll come on the back of me, I don't know. Uh, anyway, so uh, since we are already late, we'll be a bit over time. I'm sorry, we'll fin try to finish at half past... Uh, Seven, um, and maybe we just start with a very quick uh, round table. Maybe each of you can just introduce yourself and your company, but be, please be very brief. The goal of you is not to try to sell anything to anyone here. I don't think you will have an order today, at least not from this audience today. But the message is really, we are real. It's quantum, it's, it's superposition, it's complicated, it's entanglement and all that, but it is real. These guys are doing real business, they are selling and so on. So maybe, uh, Grégoire, you can start? Yeah. Thank you, Nicolas. Good evening, everyone. My name is Grégoire Ribordi. I'm the CEO and founder of ID Quantique, a spin-off from the University of Geneva, and we specialize in technologies based on quantum physics in order to secure communications. And we've heard already a little bit about it. We rely more and more on digital information sharing, not only people, but more and more machines and objects. It's very important to guarantee the security of these communications, the integrity, the confidentiality of this information. There are tools that exist today known as cryptography, but they, these tools don't offer long-term security and will become vulnerable uh, uh, over time. And so our mission at IDQ is to develop solutions based on quantum physics to secure information sharing. And I think it's very important to note here, since we're in Geneva, that Geneva played a pioneering role in, in, in this. First, uh, with the scientific research done at the University of Geneva, but also the very first demonstration of these technologies in the field. This is something in use today by governments, financial institutions, uh, and various other customers. Thank you. Yeah, um, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Nikola, for having me. Uh, my name is Patrick Malatinsky. I'm, uh, I'm representing QNAMI, a Swiss quantum startup in the sector of quantum sensing. Uh, I founded QNAMI uh, with colleagues from the University of Basel, where I'm also a professor, and I'm still involved in QNAMI uh, as an advisor and, and CSO. And so what Kinami is doing, it's bringing quantum sensing solutions to customers. Our current focus is on one hand on material science and micro and nano electronics, where we're helping researchers, engineers in these fields tap the full potential of, of their developments, of their materials and circuits that they develop. And we're also targeting on a slightly longer time scale applications in life science and medcare. Hi, my name is uh, John Penna. I am the CEO of QDTI, and we are uh, also commercializing quantum sensor technology. Um, our target application is to develop the quantum sensor to provide a novel approach for biomolecule detection and diagnostics. So as an example, um, one of our uh, key product targets is to develop an ultra-sensitive, simple-to-use <coughs> point-of-care point point care diagnostic uh, device that can be used to detect concussions or cardiovascular events such as stroke, um, wherever the consumer would like to perform that test. Uh, hello, I'm Shai Machnes and I'm CEO and co-founder of Cruise. Uh, we heard a lot today about AI and the wonderful things it can do in physics and how it can help, but everything we saw was a research project. 
what we're doing is actually building a product that's a machine learning quantum control physicist so that it can be employed in the labs of all these gentlemen over here and help move things along a lot faster. So it can characterize the system, it can simulate it, calibrate it, uh, do experiment design, everything you would expect, let's say, a junior physicist to do in the lab, our software can do for you, but you get a hundred of those and they're working 24-7. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is John Jost. I'm the co-CEO of Enlitra. And we fall more into the category of quantum enabling technology. Our specialty is lasers. In particular, we make lasers to do ultra-fast data processing as well as high-speed communication. And lasers, I would say, are probably one of the key enabling technologies for a vast array of various quantum, quantum technologies. And that's where Enlitra is also focusing a lot of their efforts on right now. Okay, I can see. Yeah, thank you. We still have two persons on the, per Zoom. So, for instance, uh, let's start with uh, QR. Can you hear me? Can you? Or I, if not, I think that you may have said. <laughs> I cannot yeah, I, hear I, you. I think that you must have said my name. Uh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback, so I'm going to ignore my own voice to just say hi, everybody. Hi, my name is Nate Gemelke. I'm, I'm the CTO of like Era Computing. And uh, what we do is actually build quantum computers and big ones. Uh, so I'm coming to you from Boston, uh, where we're hard at work in our facility, where we're building uh, machines for online access. And so if you doubt quantum computing is real, I'd encourage you to just log in to AWS broadcast service and log into one of our quantum computers that are built out of uh, neutral atoms. Uh, explore those with all 256 qubits. Okay. So, Chris, please. Hello, good evening. Uh, it's afternoon here in Washington. Uh, my name is Chris Monroe. Uh, I'm the co founder and chief scientist uh, at IonQ. We are a public company that uh, makes full stack quantum computers based on individual atomic ions. Uh, by uh, by all accounts, the performance standards in our systems are really kind of the best in class, and we're uh, we have a, a, a several uh, concrete scalable plans. Partly because we don't manufacture atoms; they're kind of made for us. So uh, uh, all of the errors, like in uh, Nate system at QERA, are, are uh, control errors, uh, and this requires a healthy dose of engineering. So at IQ, we do. Of course, the atomic physics, the quantum packages down at the very bottom of the stack, the engineering in the middle, and then very importantly, I didn't talk about it, software and applications engineering, co-designing that full stack. Thank you. Nice to be here. Okay, thank you very much. So maybe let me just summarize. You have here, how many are we? Seven, eight uh, companies. Uh, three are from Switzerland, three are from the US, uh, one from Germany. Uh, some are doing quantum computation, some are doing quantum communication, some are doing quantum sensing, some are doing very specific uh, lasers, some are more kind of uh, toolkit for our industries, and some are young, some are quite older. So you see the, all this, this variety, uh, and this is actually the, the main message. And let's maybe start with uh, Grégoire uh, Ribordi, so IDQ, the, the local guy, let's say because this is the, the oldest from all these uh, startups. Actually, IDQ is no longer a startup. It's more than 20 years old. So uh, what kind of uh, analysis can, can you now deliver after 20 plus years? Uh, how fun is it to be a quantum startup? How challenging is it? Well, um well, that, that's a difficult question. I think we started too early, Nicola, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, somehow we were ahead of uh, the curve. It's been a lonely place for many years, uh, but the good news is that we were right. We kept going in the right direction, and uh, we, we see now the market uh, materializing, and, uh, and uh, we, we see much more traction. I think uh, 
uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult uh, when you start too early. And uh, you and I often discussed also with Hugo Zbinden, one of our co-founders, we all, always set, uh, thought, you know, what should we do? Should we try very hard, fail, and, and if we fail, fail quickly? Or should we be here for the long term? I think we did it the Swiss way. You know, in Switzerland, we're a bit more conservative. We want to do things right. We decided to go slower, uh, but to build a company for the long term. And I think in the end, uh, we, we were right. Yeah, thank you. I agree, by the way. Uh, so maybe a, a question to those who, uh, who are still startups, but already, I don't know, four or five years old. So almost no longer startup. So how would you uh, well, qualify first the, 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 the opening that IDQ provided to you? And when will you stop presenting yourself as a startup? I don't know, Patrick, for instance, you can start on that one. Well, um, thanks for the question. So the, to the first part, um, of course, we're extremely grateful to ID Conti to you know, pave the way for us and being inspiring role models, I would say, for how to grow a quantum company. And I think this uh, organic, sustained growth that Gregoire before uh, described, I think, was, was very inspiring for <laughs> us. And I mean, we had discussions very early on when, when we, we spun out, um, and, and this was extremely helpful. So, so I think you know, thanks to you, Gregoire, and, and others, for all your support. Then to your second question about when will we stop calling ourselves a startup, I think you know, the, the question is also, the question is rooted in you know, what is your definition of a startup? And, and maybe my personal definition is that it's qualified on one hand by a certain proximity to an academic partner. In, in our case, it's, it's my own research group in Basel University. And secondly, I think it's still characterized by a large growth rate, gro larger than in the industry. Startup wants to grow to establish itself. So I would say, we stop being a startup once we go a bit away from, from those two points. Um, when will that happen? I do not know. It's maybe you know, once our growth goes closer to the industry that we're, we're tending to. And I, I gave you before two key applications that we're pursuing. The first one is a real one. There's a product that exists today. We're selling, we're seeing customers, we know our, our market. And there I would claim that maybe you know, in four or five years' time, we stop being a startup, we're starting to be a, a, an SME and, and grow, grow there. On this second uh, branch, on life science, medtech, this is a more far-reaching goal. And I think there will, you know, we'll keep being in a startup mode for, for, for another maybe 10 years, who knows? So we're trying to, we're trying to keep both feet a bit, yeah. Okay, so if a characteristic of a startup is to have a fast growth rate, we are still a startup. <laughs> yeah, I, I I agree with that as well, and I, I think the way, I think what you highlighted is that, you know, every situation is different, and so I'll, I'll answer this question from, from my perspective, and I, I consider a company a startup until they're able to de-risk the technology enough such that they're able to make a product that provides meaningful revenue, and then you, you make a transition from startup to, to growth phase, and, and so what does it mean to de-risk the technology platform? I, I think there's three things. Um, num number one, you actually have to show that your technology platform actually works in a commercially relevant manner. That's not easy to do sometimes. Um, secondly, you, you need to demonstrate that that platform works uh, not just once, but you know, reliably, reproducibly, uh, because you're going to be getting in front of customers and, and they're not going to be happy if it doesn't work. And, and, then, and then finally, you know, being able to, to leverage those learnings or capabilities to be able to generate a product at a scale that can lead to meaningful revenue. Um, and, and, and that, I think, is the point when you start transitioning out of startup into, into growth phase. And quantum, is it fun? I, I think that's also case specific. Um, our, our <laughs> Our, for example, I'd, I'll just pick on QDTI. You know, we're using quantum sensor technology, yes, but our application is going down a vertical in the diagnostic sector. So it's possible we'll be able to get there within 24 months. Thank you. Um, I view startup very differently from the mindset perspective. So it's about ambition to build something big. Uh, it's about the sense of urgency with which you pursue it and the uh, willingness to take certain technological risks in order to make it happen. And you can have pockets of startups within very, very large companies. 
right? There can be a lot of parts that are kind of, you know, dozy and kind of doing the same thing, and a few people off trying to do something new, right? And, and that's a startup for me. Yeah, well, we're very much in the, the startup phase being a new company, so I can say we're, we're looking towards the direction of how we become no longer a startup, and I, and I think I can agree with what was said earlier. That's really when you hit a growth phase and the company becomes very sustainable on its own with, with revenue. So that's, I think that's the key point startups want to get to. Okay, thank you. You guys in the US, you want to add something? Are you still yeah, a startup, okay. Chris? Now that you are public. Sure. <laughs> um, I guess I'd like to say that at INQ, we um, are having our cake and eating it too. <laughs> so, you know, the, the great thing about a startup, it's been mentioned by the others, and I agree with m much of what's been said. We're still a, a sort of a small company, less, you know, of order 200 employees. We have very strong university ties. This is very important. Duke University and University of Maryland, all of the IP owned by the university goes 100% licensed to the company. And so the very far areas of research, we can still do at the universities. Um, and that's great about you know, the, the startup mentality and the startup culture, we have all that. But INQ is a public company. Um, and so the good parts of not being a startup, we enjoy that all of our technology has been proven. It's not, we're not a physics lab. And I think in quantum computing, there's a lot, I'm, I'm glad that behemoths are doing quantum physics research. That's great, that's what they need to do. Uh, uh, I, I don't really see much of a business plan with some of the platforms out there, to be honest, but it's great they're doing research. Um, the other, and, and I'll, I'll finally say, the great thing about not being a startup is that we don't have to raise money. Um, we do, uh, we're, uh, revenue is growing and we need to be uh, self-sustainable, but not for a number of years. Uh, and so our path of going public was mainly to remove the biggest risk of our company, that is access to capital. So we don't have to raise money. Okay, thank you. Maybe for you, Natalie, let's move to another question, one that we got from someone from the audience here. So w w which event made quantum such a hot topic? Wh what happened, I don't know, 10 years ago, that suddenly quantum is a hot topic, which certainly was not the case when I was a student? <laughs> You know, that's a good question. Actually, I ask myself that question all the time uh, because I do think that quantum information science has been something that has been making consistent strides, uh, you know, basically since the idea of it really, you know, got laid down in the 80s. And, you know, I don't think that there's a single event that we can point to that really says that, you know, now is the right time for quantum. But there were a lot of, you know, hard, hard tech breakthroughs, um, you know, that really, makes this, um, you know, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna try to mute, my, mute myself and see if you guys can hear me a little bit better because I hear thousands of echoes coming after me, which I, you know, magnifies my voice. But uh, I think the important thing to say here is that what we really need to concentrate on is all of the inflection points that we see in quantum information science. And I think that there have been a lot, and I think that there are a lot uh, that we will have uh, coming ahead of us as well. So I think, you know, we should count inflection points multiply and we should say uh, not, you know, what was the one that in the past drove, let's say what's coming next. And I think what's coming next is, is becoming clear. We're building huge systems now. We have hundreds of qubits, hundreds of atoms uh, put into, into uh, quantum machines that everyone can access worldwide now. Uh, that itself is an inflection point. You know, there are many that are going to come. Uh, I think we need to focus on what's happening now and what's happening next. Thank you very much. Actually, we are already at the end of uh, the time, so I don't want to take too much more time of you. Um, again, the goal was mostly to show you that some of the re things are re really uh, very real. For instance, what happened between, okay, when I was a student and today, which makes all these startups possible, all these physics so timely, uh, is really the possibility to manipulate and control individual quanta, individual photons, individual atoms, individual ions. That was something uh, unthinkable when I, when I was a, a young student. Um, one of the good questions here is also, how quickly is the quantum market growing? Uh, I don't think there is an answer. I'm not going to go again around everyone, because let's say, let's be, be, be uh, uh, honest, it is fluctuating. Someday it is growing like hell, 
and the other day, it's not so good any longer. So let's be frank, that's the situation of startups. We, we're not selling daily. We have very good sales, and I'm sure I can say that in the name of everyone, because we are all these kind of startups. Um, but what is certainly also correct, it is a super exciting time. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for being a bit late, and uh, sorry for the confusion during these presentations today, uh, but that's the best we could do. Okay, Jean-Marc, back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you very much to all the participants uh, to the round table. Thank you very much to all the speakers we had today. Uh, I hope you had some uh, ideas of, on, on possible future quantum technologies. So I wish you all a very good, very good evening and uh, beautiful quantum dreams. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.